Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're all glad you could be here today for our MeSH virtual seminar series. Uh, my name is Melissa Rogers. I'm Associate Director of Business Development and Industry Relations at the USC MeSH Academy at the Keck School of Medicine. Uh, next slide. All right, great. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the MeSH Academy, we are a dedicated team at the Keck School of Medicine at USC with the mission to empower the convergence of research across disciplines to address challenges in human health and disease. We take a holistic approach and bring deep functional expertise to help USC researchers connect and collaborate both in internally at USC and externally with the life science industry to exchange ideas, increase collaborative research and entrepreneurial knowledge and build relationships to create long lasting value. All right, great. So next, uh, oh yeah. So um, just a little housekeeping here um, as far as our Q and A um, that we will have after our presentation. Um, we really ask everyone to please, if you have a question, please raise your hand um, and we'll be able to allow you to speak and you'll be able to talk to our speaker directly. Um, again, if you, if you don't you know, feel comfortable with speaking directly to our speaker, you're welcome to put your question into the Q&A and I'll be able to read that, um, read that out for you. But again, we, we really encourage everyone to use the raise your hand feature. We'd like to make this as interactive as possible. All right, well, so we're really excited for our speaker today. So today it's my honor to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Doc Edge. So Dr. Edge is assistant professor of biological sciences in the quantitative and computational biology section at the Dornslife College of Letters, Arts and Sciences. His talk today is entitled The New Forensic Genetics, a case study in genetic privacy. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Edge. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for the intro and for the invitation. Let me just share my screen here. Here we go. Yeah, so um, as Melissa said, the title uh, today, I'm going to be talking about new forensic genetics, new things that are happening in forensic genetics. Uh, and how they relate to genetic privacy. Uh, so before I start, I want to just say a few words about genetic privacy. Uh, so there's been a lot of interest in privacy quite generally in the past 10, 15 years or so, as, as so much of our lives has kind of moved into digital formats and online. Um, and many of those kinds of privacy, you know, often we're thinking about, we hear about breaches all the time, you know, uh, you know some big organization lost their list, of credit card information or something, and, and all of it's out there on the internet somewhere on the dark web. And so how is this similar to and different from that? So, so a couple of differences. One is I think if you lose your genetic information to some other actor, uh, it's maybe less obviously and immediately disruptive um, as, as you know, losing say your credit card number, or your, your social security number. Um, there, there's a limit to what we can do with genetic information right now. On the other hand, when you lose it, it's permanent. If you, if you lose your credit card number, uh, it's, it's a big pain, but you can eventually change that, uh, get a new credit card, cancel your old one. So losing your genetic information is different, right? You can't get a new chromosome eight if somebody gets your, your, your genetic information. Another big difference that pops up in a lot of different ways, and we'll talk about one of them today, is that the way genetic information is structured in the population uh, makes it challenging to protect uh, the privacy of that information in some ways. And it also makes it kind of hard to think about um, whose privacy is it. Uh, so I'm showing you just, this is a little toy schematic. If you think back to high school biology, we've got a generation of ancestors here and then some progeny here and then another generation of progeny here. And if you look at these progeny, they're like little mosaics of the ancestors and they share pieces of these mosaics. Uh, and the, the way those work, it's just because of the way recombination happens as genetic information is passed down. But, but the upshot is that one person's genetic privacy isn't actually just one person's genetic privacy. Uh, it's, it's everyone there sort of reasonably closely biologically related to has a stake in that. And that I think makes it sort of interesting and also difficult to think about. So today I'm gonna to talk about 
some work in forensics, as I said. Uh, and for, in forensics, um, I, I really mean like the attempt to figure out what happened in some place using physical evidence. So we often think about crime scenes, but it's not always that. So I'll talk about how it's been done for the past 25 or even really 35 years. And then a couple of things that, that have been introduced recently in just in the last couple of years. There've been many changes over this time, but I'm just gonna focus on one recent one. And then a, a third thing I'll talk about is uh, some privacy risks that have appeared in databases that are used for uh, what's called long range search or, or sometimes forensic genetic genealogy. So um, if you've watched CSI or Law and Order or you know, any, of any, any number of sort of crime procedurals, um, you've seen people bring up DNA evidence uh, with respect to some sort of crime, at least in a story, or if you read about you know, true crime sort of stuff in the news, uh, DNA evidence comes up all the time. And it's been a big deal in forensics really for the last 35 years, going back to Alec Jeffries et al in 1985, when they first sort of showed it was possible to use and feasible to use DNA uh, to re-identify people. So one thing that law enforcement likes about DNA is that you get this nearly unique identifier for a person. All right, it's not exactly unique if we have identical twins, it won't be exactly unique. Uh, and you know, there might be other caveats we need to think about depending on where we're looking, but you get uh, a lot of, a lot of ability, ability to differentiate somebody from anyone else in the population. A second thing is that you get it from many tissues, right? So like a fingerprint gives you this unique identification feature, but you have to, you know, somebody has to touch somebody from something with their finger for you to see the fingerprint. Uh, whereas there's lots of ways that DNA information can be recovered. Sort of any tissue in the body that's sloughed off or even things that you've just touched, uh, can, you can leave DNA on them. And then third, there's also some nice satisfying mathematical models to express the weight of evidence. And there's a ton of controversy in this area. I'm not meaning to suggest it's simple, but just the fact that you can kind of start to write down models uh, makes it different from some other types of evidence that are used in, in forensics. Um, before I move on, I just wanna give a couple of clarifications. I'm gonna use the word family a lot today and relatives. And um, I'm, I'm really referring specifically to paths of sort of sperm and egg through the population. So, so being sort of reasonably closely related to somebody in that biological sense. And there's lots of ways of defining family. Um, and I don't wanna privilege that over any others just to say I'm using it as a shorthand for that one sense. The other thing, I'll, similarly, I'll be talking about uh, sort of maternal and paternal lines. And I kind of mean like egg paths and sperm paths respectively. And there's lots of ways of defining who's mom and dad. So the way this has been done in the US at least over the past, say since the mid nineties or so uh, is by uh, use of these loci, they're called the CODIS loci, that stands for combined DNA index system. So I'm showing you a picture here of, uh, this is like a picture of a cartoon of chromosomes and the locations on the chromosomes of these various um, markers that are used for forensic genetic work typically. So the, the, the traditional set, there were 13 of them up until I think 2017, and they added seven more uh, of the autosomal ones, meaning they're not on the sex chromosomes. There's also the sex chromosome pair here. Um, and so these are, these are, you might think, why, how do I get unique identification if I only am looking at 13 spots in the genome? Can't people just agree by chance? And so what they've done is they've picked these genetic markers that are called uh, short tangent repeat markers or STRs. People also call them microsatellites. And there's, they're very highly mutable. They mutate fast. And there's lots of different things you could see there, lots of different alleles uh, at each of these loci. Uh, what they are is different numbers of repeats. So somebody, there might be some short motif, um, you know, G-A-T-A-C, say. And it, it repeats a different number of times in different copies of the chromosome. So you can have any number of versions of the DNA there. Uh, and and they mutate fast. So just with these 13 spots, you get a nearly unique identification for somebody. This database is really heavily used. Uh, there's over, it's actually not one database, it's a whole system of state level databases, but there are over 19 million profiles in it. And I always like to say 4 million of those come from arrestees. Uh, so we often think of these as just being, you know, 
you get convicted of a crime and then you get entered in the database or you know maybe there's a crime scene sample and it gets entered in the deba database uh, but actually four million of these profiles come from people who are arrested and not necessarily uh, convicted of a crime later and that's allowed in many states including california and uh, the this database isn't just sitting around uh, they are using it all the time it's been used in over half a million investigations used can mean many things it doesn't mean it was a key part of the evidence necessarily but it is it is being used a lot at the same time so it's this workhorse system put together very deliberately over the course of the 90s but it's it's getting a little old right we're in the genomic age it feels maybe a little funny to be looking at and storing 13 markers at 13 places or 20 places and uh, CODIS alone, because it's using very few genotypes, it's limited for some more advanced applications that law enforcement is in principle interested in. And we'll talk about one of them today. Um, other kinds of genotyping, I put up here SNP genotyping, that stands for um, single nucleotide repeat or single nucleotide polymorphism, excuse me. Uh, genotyping is cheaper uh, than STR genotyping is, even though it's with SNPs, you're getting 300,000 of them. Whereas with STRs, you're getting 13 or 20, and the prices are actually comparable. Um, and you can learn more uh, from a SNP genotype, uh, a full SNP panel than from STRs. So what, what has happened is that this creates kind of a strain, right? You've got this older legacy system. Uh, there's a lot of investment in it. And then newer technologies that can do these other exciting things that law enforcement wants to be able to do and so what I think you see them doing is just kind of hopping over and using the advanced stuff every once in a while um, while this CODA system sort of continues to build up. And that's led to some interesting tensions. People, it's not all being done in the same way as when CODIS was being put together. So today I wanna to talk toward, I, I, I wanna convince you that we're stumbling toward uh, what I would say is a de facto national forensic DNA database system via what's called forensic genetic genealogy. And that's interesting, right? Because we're not choosing to have explicitly to have a national DNA database system. Uh, that would be one thing. We're just kind of implementing these policies that in effect make it so that we virtually have a national uh, database. And at least one important database that's used for this has had uh, major privacy issues. Um, others may as well. I'm just gonna mostly talk about one. So um, now let me tell you about this new idea I alluded to that's showing up in forensic genetics. And it's called, sometimes people call it long range familial search. Uh, sometimes people call it forensic genetic genealogy and how many of us heard about it first. Uh, it, I think it had been applied before this, but maybe the first really high profile application was in this case of this person. This is Joseph D'Angelo. Um, you may know him if you've read the news as a Golden State Killer. And he committed this really heinous series of crimes uh, through the 70s and 80s um, throughout California. And so they, they had DNA, they had a biological sample from D'Angelo uh, from one of these crime scenes. And at the time it would have been, you know, the early 80s, they couldn't have really done anything with it in terms of DNA, uh, but they, they put it into a freezer apparently uh, and when CODIS came around, presumably they, they pulled it out, genotyped it at the CODIS markers, uh, put it back in the freezer. And we're hoping, you know, maybe, maybe D'Angelo will show up, maybe we'll arrest him in some other context uh, and we'll get a match against uh, this, this old profile in the database. And that never happened. Uh, so what do you do next? So one thing you can do is start looking for relatives. And uh, that's what they did. So the first thing you can do is start doing that in CODIS, um, which or I, I should say, now I'm gonna talk about uh, this, this preprint, uh, if you wanna read more about what I'm saying. Um, and then we did this one right after uh, our preprint with Graham Coop here, uh, we did right after the Golden State Killer news broke. And so it's sort of back of the envelope. We just wanted to get a quick sense of, um, of this question. And then it was done in a, in a very nice paper, much more thorough and empirically uh, a few months later by Yaniv Ehrlich and colleagues. And this paper is very much worth reading. So, so if you're looking for a relative of somebody because you want to, you, they're not in your database, but you want to still maybe find them. The first thing you can do is, is try a familial search using just the CODIS markers. So I only have 13 or maybe 20 markers 
but maybe I can find um, some relatives. And you can do it as long as we're talking about, you know, parents or siblings or offspring. Uh, we'll be able to find people who are first degree relatives using CODIS. By the time you get out to the first cousin range, you're already pushing it. It's already maybe too distant a relative to reliably distinguish, you know, this person's a first cousin versus they're just a random person from the population. So um, this has been done, it's worked before, but you kind of have to get lucky. You have to have a close relative in the database. Um, it was, if you remember the, green, the Grim Sleeper case about 10 or 15 years ago, it was done using CODIS in this way. Um, but what if instead of having 13 markers, you had hundreds of thousands, 300,000, 500,000, like you'd get from a SNP chip. What can you do then? Well, you can get out much further in the family tree. So um, you can ignore the annotations on this pedigree um, I just wanted a picture of pedigree. So if our person of interest, say it's this little black uh, circle down here, that's the person we want to find. Uh, so if we've got their genotypes on CODIS and we run it against the CODIS uh, database, we'll be able to find them if any one of the people in, these little, in this little circle is, happens to be in CODIS, then we'll get lucky and we'll catch them. They're, they're beacons for this person. But if I can use full SNP information uh, from across the genome, uh, anybody in this tree is potentially a beacon for me to get back to this person. Uh, the process of going from some distant relative out here, way out here in the tree over to here might be hard, uh, but they can at least start me on a, on a process of getting where I want to go. So let me see how this works. Um, so I'm showing you a picture now. of This is a simulation of your 22 autosomal chromosomes, so excluding the sex chromosomes. And you can think of the red bits as a, a simulation of the places in your genome that were, were also in your maternal grandmother. So you get a quarter of your genome from your maternal grandmother on average, and you get it in this sort of big blocky kind of distribution. So it's, it looks more like we cut a deck of cards, right, than like we shuffled one. So the red bits, are they come in big chunks. They aren't like interspersed in fine little pieces. And that's just because of the way meiosis works. It's relatively sparse. Here's uh, another descendant of the same maternal grandmother. This person's going to be your first cousin. And they also have a quarter of their genome from this person. It's going to be a different quarter. Uh, but it also has this sort of big blocky cutting a deck rather than shuffling a deck sort of distribution. And if we overlap these, now I'm showing the purple segments are, are places uh, where you and your first cousin are identical genetically by virtue of inheriting information from this shared maternal grandmother. And you can see, we, we call these I, IBD blocks, that stands for identical by descent. And we've got them all over the genome, it's riddled with them. So it's gonna be very easy to tell uh, that you and your first cousin are related genetically if we have genome-wide information. And we're gonna be able to see these blocks as long as they're reasonably long. Um, if you, if you know genetic distances, as long as they're on the order of like three centimorgans or five centimorgans, we'll be able to see them. Uh, and even some, we can see if they're shorter than that. So here's an analogous image for third cousins. So now, instead of looking at a, a, a grandmother, we're looking at a great-great-grandmother. And so now we, we, we inherit a 16th of order from this person. Uh, your third cousin now, we're looking at talking about a third cousin instead of a first cousin. They also get a 16th from this shared relative. It's going to be a different 16th. And in this case, um, you can see that we have a couple of overlapping segments. There's a couple IBD segments here, and we'll be able to see those. So in this case, we'll be able to tell that you and your third cousin are genetically uh, related recently. But you can imagine that if the overlap is only a 16th and a 16th, we could get unlucky. And we couldn't miss it. Uh, and then we wouldn't be able to find this relative. And in fact, that does, um, this is exactly where that starts to happen. Um, and um, this is a plot of that. So on the horizontal axis here, this is the degree of the cousin, first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, and so on. And then the vertical axis is the probability we'll be able to detect this cousin relationship genetically uh, if we have genome-wide information, say. So uh, you can see that for first cousins and second cousins, we're, we're very rarely going to miss, if ever. 
Uh, but by the time we get to the third cousin range, we start to miss some of these relationships. We can't see them genetically. That's really interesting, right? Uh, you have these, they're completely your cousins. They're genealogically third cousins, but genetically you're actually no more closely, uh, you, you don't have any closer relationship with them genetically than anybody, a random person from the population. So um, these three different lines are different uh, stringencies we might apply to detecting this relationship. So you can kind of ignore the difference between them. By the time, the, the upshot is by the time we get to the fourth cousin range, about half of them we can't see genetically. So if you think you're, maybe you know who some of your fourth cousins are, I, I don't personally, uh, but only about half of the time can we actually tell if we have um, genetic information that these are gonna be fourth cousins. And fifth cousins, most of the time, we can't tell. So that's a genetic process. As you get, uh, so this is much a much bigger range than CODIS had. CODIS, again, like even here at the beginning, we're already way down below one. Uh, so we can get way further out in this tree uh, with CODIS, but it does start to fall off in sort of the third and fourth cousin range. The other thing going on is there's a genealogical phenomenon. So as we increase the degree of the relationship, so first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, fourth cousin, the number of cousins you have goes up really, really fast. Uh, so this is based on a demographic model of the UK. It, it depends on the demography of the population and the way families are structured and all this. But in this, in this situation, the average person has five first cousins, 28 second cousins, and uh, 175 third cousins and close to 1600 fourth cousins. So if we can only see out to say the first cousin range, we've got five shots at finding somebody uh, in our database. But if we can get all the way, all the third cousins and half of the fourth cousins, we've got maybe a, you know, more like a thousand chances to find this person. Uh, and so putting these, putting these together, there's this genetic phenomenon of it gets harder to detect cousins as you go further out and the genealogical phenomenon that you have more cousins as you get further out in the tree. The, the x-axis here, we're now showing the degree of the cousin again for second, third, and fourth. And this y-axis is now the expected number of genetically detectable cousins in a database of a given size. And this is based on, all based on a sort of toy demography of the US. Um, but like, think about a database of a million people. If we have a million random Americans, um, you're, the average person is not going to have many first cousins in the database because they don't have that many first cousins, period, right? Uh, and second cousins, again, maybe not very many. But by the time you get to third cousins, uh, the average person actually has a substantial number of third cousins if you take a random set of a million Americans uh, and even more fourth cousins. And, and, uh, and these are just the genetically detectable ones, right? So, so there's actually, they have more fourth cousins than this, but we can't see about half of them. So... Uh, that suggests that if, if, we, if we had access to a database of a million people, um, we'd be able to track down maybe most people. This isn't exactly the computation you do to figure that out, uh, but it's suggestive. And there in fact are now these large databases uh, full, full of SNP information. So genome-wide single nucleoside polymorphism genotypes. And they're used for the use cases genealogy typically. So people wanna find their relatives. Um, you're probably familiar with Ancestry DNA and 23andMe. This, is, this plot's a couple years old. These, this is showing the growth in these companies over time in terms of user base. Um, they're much bigger now. Law, so if law enforcement could get into these, they'd be able to find most of us, right? Because most of us will have cousins in these places. Uh, they can't get into these though, because they, you, know, you have to send away for the spit kit, um, send it back to the company and get registered in their database. But these ones down here, law enforcement actually, what they realize is they can search these uh, because these ones allow you to upload data. And since, you know, since they did this, several of these companies had said, have said, you actually, we're not gonna let you search us. But in principle, when law enforcement was thinking about this, they realized, okay, we can take our biological sample from D'Angelo out of the freezer. Uh, we can genotype it at a bunch of SNP sites format it the way 23andMe does, and then just upload it as if we were a 23andMe user trying to find our relatives on one of these other sites. And that's exactly what they did um, with, with one of these ones, it's called GEDmatch. 
And um, it, it was big news a couple of years ago. So I believe this is March of 2018 or April of 2018. And uh, this is exactly how they did it. They, they, they traced out a genealogical tree uh, and then traced it back down. They incidentally ran into at least one wrong, uh, wrong lead on the way. They ended up following a guy around his nursing home who was not the guy. Uh, but they did eventually get to D'Angelo and, and, and bring him in. And then when they genotyped him in CODIS, he matched exactly with their old sample. So take a second to appreciate the power of that. CODIS at the time had 18 million profiles in it, and they never found, found D'Angelo himself, and they never found a relative. GEDmatch uh, had only a million profiles in it, roughly, at the time. And they found several relatives, I believe. They probably had more than enough to find him. And it wasn't a lucky shot. Most of us are findable in this way. Depends a bit on various factors. You know, how, how, how much ancestry you have in the US recently, how much your ancestry kind of matches the people who tend to use services like GEDmatch. But nonetheless, probably most of us uh, in the United States will be findable in this way. So epilogue for this technology, forensic gen gen genealogy, epilogue is sort of the wrong word because it's very much ongoing. Uh, but Golden State, the Golden State Killer, he pled guilty uh, uh, just a few months ago. Some of you might've seen the news. You can see it's during the coronavirus pandemic. Everybody's got their shields on. And he's now doing life in prison. Incidentally, the, this technique though has now become increasingly popular, increasingly routine. It's been used to solve over 50 cases, which is super rapid uptake. Uh, and, and who knows how many more are in progress. And GEDmatch, the character of this database that they used to do this has been totally transformed. Uh, so GEDmatch was built by a couple of guys in, in Florida who loved genealogy. They loved helping people find their families, helping adoptees find their birth parents and so on. And it was sort of built like on a shoestring it's, it was this real community project, kind of labor of love, kind of had this Wikipedia feel where it's like bubbling forth from the enthusiasm of this community. And then you can imagine that as soon as these, this news came out that it had been used in this way, the character of that really changed overnight. And it really split the community. You had a lot of people in the community who were really happy uh, that their, their DNA could be used um, in this way. And then you had a lot of people in the community who were, really didn't like this. Uh, they felt sort of violated by um, the, the notion that they might be searched through in this way. And it still really split the community. Um, and in fact, uh, it's been, the, the, the character has, is still quite different because it was bought about a year ago by a forensic genetics company called Viragen. And um, so now they're, they're running it as far as I know in, in pretty much the same way as it was run before. Uh, but you know, that's kind of in the background, right? It's no longer this community project. It's, it's now a forensic genetics company. So a question that Graham, my collaborator and I were, were started thinking about as we were doing this work I just told you about was, is this actually safe? Uh, so GEDmatch was not really built to do this kind of work, right? It was built uh, for, you know, with the assumption that everybody using it is gonna be operating in good faith sort of bubbling out of this community of enthusiasts and professional genealogists, not really built to withstand the kind of um, official serious use that law you might think a law enforcement database would need. So we started to think, are there ways that you could actually mess with this database um, given the way it was built? And we found some ways. Another, so here's our paper. It came out in eLife a few months ago. Um, this paper from Peter Ney and colleagues was being done in parallel without our knowledge uh, and is also very much worth reading. They sort of uh, are complementary and emphasize different, um, different risks. So I sort of alluded to this before, but let me just say again clearly what this ecosystem is that we're thinking about. It's, it's, it's the upload ecosystem for genetic genealogy. So maybe a typical person going through this, they'll get genotyped most often by one of the biggest companies. Um, the biggest ones are Ancestry DNA and 23andMe. And then if, if they're, they're really serious about it and they really want to find more relatives that maybe they haven't found, maybe they have some specific goal in mind, some specific relatives they want to learn about, um, they might want to see who's in other databases. One way they could do that is by being genotyped by a bunch of other companies. 
That's a little expensive though. So another thing that many of these places will let you do is they'll let you just download your data from Ancestry 23 and Me and upload it to their database. So here's, here's some organizations that let you do that. GEDmatch, Family Tree DNA, My Heritage, and Living DNA. This is a little too simple because these latter three, they'll all also genotype you if you want. They're not strictly upload services, but, but many, of their, uh, many of their users do come in via uploads. And that's either free or, or much cheaper for the user. So it benefits them in that way. And these companies, you know, they get to draft a little bit on the success of the big ones and grow their databases. So then the user will be presented with matches in some way. And those matches might be just, you know, names or profile names of other users. Uh, or in some cases, you might actually get back a, a sort of chromosome browser kind of information where you can see, oh, you know, you have IBD segments with this person here, here, and here. And that's how we know that they're, uh, you know, whatever relationship we think they are to you, your cousin or whatever it is. So there's a lot in this table. Um, the big things are, I already said this, Ancestry and, me and uh, Ancestry and 23andMe are the big ones. Um, this is about a year out of date. They're probably bigger now. They don't allow uploads. Uh, all these others do allow uploads, but only two of them actually now allow law enforcement. Uh, there are other newer ones that allow law enforcement. One I can think of is Othram uh, that allows um, uploads and also allows law enforcement to search. Um, and the way this is done is actually different between these two. Family Tree, I believe, um, allows you uh, to opt out if you don't want to be searched. Um, GEDmatch, you have to opt in if you want to be searched. Uh, that was done sort of a few months after the initial news broke. So our question, Graham, Graham's and my question was, could somebody who wanted to learn the genetic information of people in a database, could they do it just by uploading the right data? So without trying to actually hack into the database directly, just use sort of the chromosome browser tools or the match tools uh, that are given back to us and learn something about the genetics of, of people in this database that I maybe shouldn't know. And we did come up with three methods of attack. Um, this is a short talk, so I'm, I'm only gonna explain one of them, which we call IBS tiling. IBS stands for identity by state, which is closely related to that identical by descent concept I gave you before. Uh, another one called IBS probing and another one called IBS baiting. So I'm going to tell you a bit about how tiling works. Uh, and then I'm just going to tell you how well baiting works and, and show you a little bit about that one. So the idea of tiling um, comes from the, the, the intuition for it is just that these, these matches that we get from these companies, they reveal genotype information to us that maybe we shouldn't necessarily have. Uh, so I'm showing you my own, this is information from my own 23andMe profile. Uh, this is a set of matches against someone they're saying is my second cousin. It's not a person I've ever met, but I presume they're right. Uh, that I, you know, maybe I'm not exactly a second cousin, but I'm some kind of reasonably close relative with this person. And what it's showing you is my chromosomes and it's telling you, you know, in this spot in chromosome one, you have a match with this person. You're half identical there. So I know my own genotype because 23andMe gave it to me. And I know that I match this person in these spots. And so I know something about her genotype in these spots. And if my two relatives got together, if they both took their chromosome eight matches to me and said, we wanna learn Doc's genome, they could learn more about my genome than either of them could together by sort of comparing their matches to each other uh, or comparing their actually full um, genetic information, say, and, and, and using their matches to me to learn more about what I've got. So the inside of IBS tiling is we can, we can just do this. My two relatives don't have to get together. I can just take a bunch of genetic information that's out there on the internet, upload all of it, keep track of all the matches, and then learn some target I care about, learn their genotype. So here's a target. You can think of this as like a stretch of chromosome. And what I'll do is just start uploading genetic information. Uh, and if there's a match represented by this little blue line, uh, then I've learned something about the target in that spot. And I can throw up the next one, but maybe find a different match in a different spot, learn something more about the target and just keep going until potentially I've learned quite a bit about the target. And there's thousands of DNA data sets out there. Many of them are, are up there for 
uh, genetic research purposes. Uh, so you can think of the Human Genome Diversity Project data set, the Thousand Genomes Project, things like that. Uh, and then there's also just DNA enthusiasts who put up their own genetic information voluntarily via the Personal Genome Project. So question, how well does this work? So we're not doing this to be clear in, in GEDmatch or in one of these other databases. We're just kind of asking the question about, this is just asking a question about how much people tend to overlap um, and how, so how well this could work in principle. So the x-axis here you can think of as the number of people you upload. Uh, so going from 100 to almost 900. And the y-axis is um, how much, these are all European um, genomes, by the way, there's other things we could talk about, about different ancestries. Um, but we did all these within, within people of European ancestry. And uh, the y-axis is how much of the genome uh, lengthwise uh, do we get back uh, on median? So from a median person, the, the, a typical person's risk will, will be higher or lower than this but this is sort of the median person. Um, these different lines are different length cutoffs that the database might use. So the database might say, I'm only gonna show you matches that are eight centimorgans or longer. And if they say that, we get this green line and it is actually not equal to zero exactly, but it's, it's you know, on the zero to one scale, it's quite close to zero. Uh, but the thing that's maybe most concerning here is that when you make the, the centimorgan cutoff, the length cutoff very short, say down to 0.1 centimorgans, um, and we upload say close to 900 people, we get around 70% of somebody's genetic information back uh, by doing that. And uh, the GEDmatch will actually let you do this. These 0.1 centimorgan matches, they're close to useless for uh, genetic genealogy, but GEDmatch has always taken a kind of freewheeling approach. Sure, if you wanna look at that, we'll let you. Uh, and so if you take advantage of that feature, you can get quite a lot of somebody's genome back. Let me tell you a little bit about IBS baiting, which is our third method. And I won't talk you through how it works unless we want to in the Q&A. But what it does it, is it exploits not super old, but just a little bit older methods for finding these matching segments. So you can imagine this, this is an algorithmic problem to find, if I have a big data set, to find all the places where they overlap. Uh, genetically, where they have these IBD segments. And there's an older method uh, that was, I think, initially pioneered by 23andMe, certainly they used it, um, that'll let you do this without performing another very costly processing step. And it's quite a clever method. Um, and you can see why if you're running on a shoestring and you're GEDmatch, you might want to use uh, a method that lets you not do some very difficult computational step. And we realized that if you do this, you can actually upload fake data sets uh, that will trick the database into revealing a genotype at any site you want uh, with either two or three uploads, depending on how uh, the database reports back the information. So you can imagine, think about like, if you're selling life insurance, say, uh, you might wanna know about somebody's propensity to get late onset Alzheimer's, say, so you might say, okay, I'm gonna get the APOE4 genotypes for everybody in GEDmatch. And as of a year ago, you could have done that uh, just with a couple of uploads that were designed in a particular way. So um, I, I won't talk to you how this picture works, but it's just showing that we were able to do this as of last December. Uh, so timeline on this, we told GEDmatch um, back when it was still uh, you know, run by these two guys on a shoestring we warned them in July of uh, 2019 about the different exploits that we thought were possible. And uh, then and we told them we were gonna publish in three months. So we published our preprint three months later, uh, just after then it was bought by Viragen and Viragen said, oh, you know, we fixed these problems. And we went back in December to check whether they'd actually been fixed. And um, there had been some things done that made it a bit tougher, but it wasn't too hard to work around and still find these matches uh, for somebody that, um, where you wanna learn their specific genotypes. So as of last time we checked, which was last December, GEDmatch appeared vulnerable to hacking on various fronts. Uh, they showed matching segments that are in my opinion too short. Uh, there's sort of no benefit 
to showing such short segments and they, they open up unnecessary privacy risks. They used outdated matching methods, uh, outdated methods for finding IBD segments. Uh, they provided high resolution images of, of um, the matches. They fiddled with them a little bit, but it's not clear how much that fiddling, uh, how well it's worked. Um, that's from the Peter Ney paper. And all that remained true even after being acquired by Virgin. So when it was no longer a sort of shoestring operation. So Coda on this, um, last July, we did actually see some, uh, a, a pretty substantial hacking attempt uh, pretty, and it seems at least partly successful into, into GEDmatch. So a lot of, they weren't using any of the methods that we, as far as we know, any of the methods that we talked about. Um, this was about exposing a bunch of email addresses and exposing kit numbers, which are essentially usernames on GEDmatch. And a lot of those were exposed and it looks like whoever took them used them to carry out a phishing attack on MyHeritage, which is one of these other genetic genealogy companies. Um, so overall, overall summary, there's these new approaches. They're very powerful. You can see right why law enforcement would want to do this, but they also entail privacy risks. And they also, I think, get us sort of beyond a point in the conversation where we naturally were in terms of having a national DNA database. Uh, privacy at GEDmatch, at least when I, when I looked, it wasn't very inspiring which maybe raises some questions like, is this ready for the police to be using it in these official capacities? And then third, uh, I think we need a broad conversation about what we want 21st century forensic genetics to look like. There's gonna be a lot of opinions out there, uh, but I think it's better to decide deliberately whether we want to have a national database as opposed to kind of backing into it uh, by default and letting, you know, letting everybody's third cousin make the decision for them. So thanks very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions and have any discussion. All right, great, great. Thanks so much, Dr. Edge. So um, yeah, we'd like to open the floor for questions. And as I mentioned earlier, we um, you know, ask that you raise your hand and you can ask your question directly to Dr. Edge. Otherwise you can um, put your question in the Q&A. All right, so we have, um, let's see, we have a question here. All right, um, let's see, Ita, I'll say, I'm gonna allow you to talk and you can ask your question. You'll have to unmute yourself. Let's see, am I, can I be heard? Yes, I hear you. we can hear you. Okay, um, my internet has been extremely unstable. I apologize. So if I drop out, that's the reason. Uh, that was a really interesting talk and <clears throat> I would love to speak to you some more because we want to established cell line grown for people who are unidentified and deceased. But I'm not sure what the consequences of that might be because anybody <clears throat> using that cell line could sequence the whole thing, right? And, uh, and how, even if the person is not identified, I would like to know more about the consequences of having such a cell line. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd be super happy to talk talk about that, um, right? Because it's a tough decision, right? Because even if the person's deceased, they may very well have a bunch of living relatives. Oh yeah, sure. And so that's um, that's often gonna be hard to think about. Right, uh, <clears throat> but of course these cell lines could, could um, be really useful tools to bring research sure. forward, cancer research, COVID research. <laughs> So yeah, I'm thinking, what do we tell people? Or, well, they're deceased. So I guess it's about the relatives. The relatives, yeah, sure, sure. So, yeah. so anyway, um, I, I think uh, your talk really made me think even more about it. So I'll, I'll shoot you an email. Great, yeah, <laughs> look forward to it. <clears throat> Thanks. All right, do we have any other questions? Go ahead and uh, raise your hand. All right, we have one, uh, Kevin. I'm gonna allow you to talk. Please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Hi, I, uh, no, I'm unmuted, yeah, I am. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, you closed with a point about the, that we need a broad conversation on forensic genetics. Uh, 
where's that conversation happening right now? You talked about some of these enthusiasts and like law enforcement, but who are sort of, who are making these decisions? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I, you know, I, I often feel like I don't have a sense of that either. Um, I can tell you a bunch of interested communities. One is certainly the genetic genealogy community. They want to they wanna have a stake in shaping this. Uh, and there's also, you know, private companies who are interested in it. Like, for example, now, you know, Virgen, um, Parabon Nanolabs, um, Othram, this other one I mentioned. Um, they're all stakeholders as well. You've got uh, defense attorneys, prosecutors, law enforcement, um, and then you know the. You've also got the um, Department of Justice, and they, they have the Department of Justice did come out with guidelines a little, I think, a little less than a year ago, um, which was sort of it, it took them a year and a half, right? And this thing was being used for a long time, this method. Um, and I, the, my lawyer friends I've talked to have told me that those guidelines they think are pretty good as a starting point, but um, it's clearly catch up ball, right? Uh, and, and I don't think there is a centralized place where this is happening. There's a bunch of different communities that have different interests. Thanks. All right, great. Next question, let's see here. Uh, we have Aaron, uh, let me, I'm gonna give you permission to talk. And go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, I'm actually a fellow at the Federal Judicial Center and I'm thinking about these questions of how well under uh, judges understand genetic uh, databases and genetic technology. So I, I'm very interested in these topics as well. Um, I guess one question I had was around the issue that, um, you know, one question is representation within these databases. And, and you've talked a lot about how, um, and, and there's a lot of good research pointing out that, you know, soon the, the number of participants in these databases will mean, you know, it's almost, if you're white European ancestry, there's almost a 90%, you know, chance or more that you'll be identifiable. But, um, but that's very different demographic from what's represented in law enforcement CODIS databases as well. And so I'm wondering if you can just comment maybe about, um, you know, do you see that power shifting in terms of the searchability? And uh, do you also have any insight about how uh, CODIS databases, law enforcement databases may also be leveraged in similar ways? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question, um, right? And there's super interesting tension in this space that, um, yeah, I, I've been talking about, people are really interested in this, <laughs> um, right? So the, the tension that it, it turns out, uh, these companies usually don't release their numbers on, you know, race or ancestry, but, but we think that these um, genealogy services are largely people of mostly European ancestry. Um, and as a result, that means, you know, Probably other people of European ancestry are at more risk um, of being found in this way, in this particular way that I talked about today, uh, than people of other ancestries. But at the same time, uh, this familial search in CODIS that I talked about, uh, yes, it's going to um, mostly fall on Black and Brown communities, minoritized people who are, you know, more represented in the CODIS database. And interestingly, like. Uh, there's not very good data on that side of things uh, either in terms of like who's in the databases. I, I, there's a lot of data on who gets arrested and who gets convicted of crimes, but in terms of representation in CODIS, it's, it's, it's not um, publicly out there yet. Um, so that's all just sort of just restating the, um, the scenario. Um, in terms of shifting it, uh, one thing I would say is, is we, we talk about risk within European populations, but we're all, um, we're all intermixed, right? So like, you know, most black people in the US will have uh, white relatives as well. Um, and you can say similar things for various different groups. And so just because, you know, we think about sort of to simplify this problem, we think about European populations with white ancestry or white race, European ancestry populations. Um, but it's going to apply to other uh, other people as well. So if you, I, I just say, if you have a lot of recent ancestors in the U.S., this is how I usually phrase it, you're probably going to have probably going to be findable. 
So I, I think that people will be more, this, the, a lot of people think of this as like, you know, maybe, maybe this is a good thing because we've got this disparity in CODIS that we know about uh, where minoritized people are being hit harder by these familial searches. So maybe having this other method will sort of balance the scales. And, you know, I, I see the idea, but I don't think it's just gonna like work out <laughs> on some level. Like, I don't think the, the math is gonna work out so that we've now got this suddenly equal system. I think it's still gonna be, um, still gonna have disparities. And I think if you wanna get rid of disparities, um, you sort of come, at, come up with a system that gets rid of them naturally, as opposed to doing a bunch of things and hoping they balance out. Um, so I think that's what I'd say on that, on that subject, but it's very interesting. Um, and, you know, I think on the CODIS side, it's very worrying, right? Like that's, that's a burden that I didn't really talk about, but um, uh, people have been worried about for a long time that these familial searches are gonna, are gonna really burden people. Thank you. Um, let's see, next question. Um, so, let's see, uh, Jonna, I'm gonna give you permission to speak and you can ask, uh, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Oh, I, I think actually it's me oh. because I was allowed oh. <laughs> to unmute, but this is Scott Fraser. Okay. So, oh, I bet, I bet Jonna RSVP'd for me. So sorry for uh, <laughs> being under here in false pretenses. Um, so, you mentioned the vulnerability where you could do two or three uploads and it seems like security does not advance on the same curve as Moore's law. And so I'm very curious as computing power has gotten better and better, has security gotten enough better that you still couldn't just scale up and, and crunch more numbers? And basically is, is it gonna be possible to secure these databases in any way, no matter what the restrictions are that are put in place, as long as there's uploads allowed? Right, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and I, I think a lot of us are worried about, you know, I, I think the, the, specific, the specific attacks I talked about today, there's ways to, fix them or at least, you know, really reduce their impact, even if you don't all the way fix them. But, you know, there could be other things, right? And so other people have thought about maybe algorithms where you do the matching in a way where it's sort of all encrypted. Um, and that works, but you lose a bit of information. And I think, uh, um, yeah. I think that might so be disappointing to some people in the genetic genealogy community. Um, at this, but I think a, a, way to, a way around this, right, is you, and this was called for in that Ehrlich et al. paper that I put up. Um, you can mark the, the data sets that you upload. Like if you can make it so like if 23andMe gives you um, a data set, it comes with an encrypted tag that tells you when you upload it somewhere else that it came from 23andMe and it hasn't been tampered with. Um, and I think in that way, you can get around a lot of the things, a lot of the foul mm -hmm. play that one might imagine because you can't, you can't design a data set to reveal information anymore. You have to use real ones. There was actually legislation that would have done that in, um, in California and uh, it was moving along fine and then, and then Newsom vetoed it. I don't know why. Okay. Just, I, I mean, I guess the question was if, uh, if you were able to upload a very large number of them with different combinatorics, could you do, could you get the sort of relational database you need right now out of it before the rules change and be able to, to have the, the large set of metadata you need to do later matches? So you, right now you'd, um, so one of the main things that, that GEDmatch did um, in response to the, the concerns that we and, and Nay had all brought up was was to um, you know you have to now uh, what are those things I'm forgetting what they're called little things you have to click on to prove you're a human <laughs> um, you have to get through one of these now uh, where you like solve a little puzzle so of course you can design bot clouds that are supposed to get around those but it is hard now to just throw up a lot of data sets um, I th I think the way GEDmatch was revealing information before it would have been very possible to do that a year and a half ago. Uh, I'm not sure it is now. You can't just brute force it. 
And also that depends on the kind of information the database shows you, right? So like, for example, Ancestry, I mean, they don't allow uploads at all, but um, they just tell you who you're related to and they don't tell you where your IBD matches are. And so that's a lot less information about, um, a lot less information that we could use, for example. Thanks. Thank you. All right, does anyone else have any, anyone else like to raise their hand and ask a question? No, we, we have a question in the Q and A. It, so it really overlaps with what you were just discussing, but kind of maybe overall, you know, how, how do we as individuals protect our genetic information from being exploited? You know, I mean, yeah, it seems um, no, to be once you've been sequenced by one of these companies, or um, is it best just not to upload, not to get sequenced by one of these companies, or you know, how is this going to work in the future? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question. I mean, um, and it, I, I'm one is tempted to say everyone sort of draws the line for themselves, but one of, one of my big points is that that doesn't quite work in this situation because uh, we're all yeah. we're all in it together in some in some sense where you know. I, if I'm making a decision, I'm kind of making a decision for my second and third cousins too. So um, I don't know the right answer. I mean, I, I can tell you, I personally feel safe. Um, uh, like I am a 23andMe customer. I don't feel endangered because of that. Um, I am, uh, I'm not an Ancestry customer, but I, I would be, I think I never would feel fine. Um, uh, and uploads, I start to get more wary of, and it just goes down to the, the reputation of the particular company. I mean, you can see the way I should say, like my heritage, I, I, don't, I don't wanna be like endorsing and not endorsing some of these companies, but like I, I see my heritage, they did really well putting down that phishing attack. Uh, and Yaniv Ehrlich, who wrote this really nice paper on, you know, he's written a lot of really nice papers on privacy. Um, he was their CTO until quite recently, or maybe he still is, he started another company as well. Uh, so like those kinds of things make me, they move me one way or the other, but that's like insider information, right? I just happen to know who's at these places. Um, I don't really have a really good general answer. Um, I guess I, I, if, if my, when my relatives ask me, I'm, in I'm inclined to encourage them to play it on the safe side. It's all I would really say. Great, thank you. Um, all right, does anyone else have any other questions? Give anyone a chance to raise their hand if they'd like to. All right. All right, well, if not, um, I'll go ahead and thank you for a really interesting presentation today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks again, it was a pleasure. Um, and yeah, I'd like to thank uh, our audience for also joining us today. And uh, you know, please keep an eye on the MeSH website and to look for our upcoming events. So we'll see you soon.